Welcome to my channel. Today I'm going to be interviewing Jude Lanmehin, who is a barrister specialising in criminal law and alternative dispute resolution. Jude practices from chambers in London, uh, Free Temple Garden Chambers, if you are interested. So Jude, welcome. Long time no see or here. Thank you very much. It's been a very, very long time. I think it's been decades since we've last met in person. I know. Even before lockdown, yeah. I know, yeah. we went to bar school together. Yes, and I remember the first day I ever set eyes on you at bar school. I remember that day. Well, I yeah, hope you so had a favourable impression of me today. It was a very favourable impression. I remember you standing on the steps, you know, and I saw you from afar in all your glory very regal surveying you know, surveying and, yes. surveying. Yes. and i've thought to myself i hope one day i'll get to speak to her majesty <laughs> if i would be allowed to be in her presence why yes. today did you decide that you wanted to become a barrister um i didn't want to become a barrister I started life um, wanting to be a scientist. Um, coming from a Nigerian background, um, you want to be a doctor, a lawyer, those two first. And as time went on, our parents started to realize that accountants actually it is a profession where people make money and is well respected. So <clears throat> then you can go into accountancy, engineering and so on and so forth but it's got to be medicine first and foremost and that was the the road I was going down and then eventually I was then attracted to the law um, through a number of friends some of the close friends that I used to go around with were in law one day I was at the uni with a number of characters, some of whom you know, mm. um, they were involved in a debate, so, sorry, a moot uh, exercise, and somebody dropped out. They were looking for a replacement. And this was the night before, and you can see where this is going to yeah. the life I later started to live, where you get everything the night before. So the night before I was approached by um, a young man who told me, um, would you like to be a partner with somebody else? And uh, because that person's partners dropped out and I says, no. And he says, you know, please, we need your help. I said, but I've never spoken publicly before. So I tried to get out of it and he, he wouldn't let me get out of it. And then I came up with what I thought was the joker when I said to him, who is the person that I'm supposed to be te teaming up with? Why can't that person ask me themselves? And I actually seriously believed the person would not have, you know, the, you know, would not come and ask me. Um, and lo and behold, to my greatest surprise, the person approached me, he just walks across very politely and says, please, can you help me? And there began what is, I believe, a lifelong friendship. And, um, and that's how we became debating partners. We eventually traveled around the UK, you know, representing the Inner Temple, but that's how it started. So, I then engaged in that uh, moods exercise. Um, we, the team, my, my team won. And the lecturer, Dr. Kate Green said to me, we don't get many people from this university. I think it was a polytechnic at the time. Said, oh, we don't get many people going to the bar. Most of them go to this solicitor profession. I think we've discovered a group of you who should go ahead to be barristers and we're going to support you. And all four of us did eventually take the bar exams. And I believe that three out of four are still practicing barristers in one form or the other. And the other gentleman is still a solicitor advocate and is still practicing. So there was four of us in the competition and 
that was the beginning of me starting to realize that there's something there which I didn't know was there myself, but which other people saw. And Dr. Kate Green said, you are going to the bar. And I remember that day, the feeling I had when I addressed the audience. And I thought, okay, this is it. And there I began that journey um, and started to think, okay, there's something more to me than just... Uh, so when I tell people that, you know, I'm a very, very shy person, I don't like speaking publicly, mm. and I'm sure you believe that. No, um, I do I, like um, Yeah. You do. I'm actually... Uh, I, yeah. I'm, the, I'm the same. I think a lot of uh, barristers are naturally quite, quite shy people, but we are yes. performers. We're like actors. A lot of actors are very shy yes. In, yes. Their, in their real private lives. But then, Absolutely. You know, when you have a job to do, you just perform. It's a performance. Yeah. You, you come alive. And I think when the job needs to be done and I didn't know I had it in me and it came and I saw that, yes, I can do this. I really want to focus now on the obstacles that you faced. Yes. Getting to the bar, because now you are an extremely successful, well sought oh, thank after you. barrister. thank you. You're welcome, yes. Jim. Uh, <laughs> well sought after barrister. But yes. I'm sure that there were some obstacles um, you, that you encountered on your way to your success. Yes, um, there were a number of obstacles some of which are obvious and some were not so obvious. Firstly, the, the major obstacle was money. As you know, the bar school was very expensive. It still is very expensive. And you have to raise the funds because even if you got a grant, in those days, we used to get grants to go to university. Um, not anymore, it's now loans. I think my final year, we started to get loans, but it, you started off getting a grant. But so far as the bar course is concerned, you've got to pay for it yourself. Yeah. So the first obstacle is raising funds, um, taking out a loan. And I think like most people, I probably had a loan to the tune of about £10,000 by the time I started pupillage. But unfortunately for me as well, because um, in every story, as you know, I always have the negatives and the positives. I was also, um, I got a scholarship as well. Uh, part of, I think my, part of the fees was paid or the tuition fees was paid by a company, a, an oil company. I got that to assist me and I got some money from the Inner Temple, but I'll tell you about that in a bit. Um, but the other obstacle, because the major obstacle was that at the time, it, it wasn't, um, it, most people now would speak up about racism. They'll speak about, up about equality. Yeah. And people feel, well, or felt victimized if you ever raised your head up to explain about racism and you also recall that at that time some black students uh, the late grace higgins yes. was leading the charge in the high court yes. against the council of legal education so we came in on the back of that if you remember because a substantial amounts of black students were failing the exams um oh, it was just yeah. yes so we were we faced all of that but in my own case, um, just to talk about my own personal circumstances, I had another problem, which was um, that particular year, if you remember when we went to bar school, there were 750 places at the school. There were about 500 or so places for pupillage. So the numbers at bar school, because that was the only bar school in existence, there's more now. Yeah. you know at that time there was only one yeah so 750 places and 2,000 people applied to get into 750 places yeah they were going to get the first and the two ones um and then it's on first come first serve I didn't know how that worked so and I had a two two in those days they used to make the jokes uh the, the Desmond 
after the great Archbishop of um, of South Africa, uh, Desmond Tutu. Okay. So yeah, I, I you know I got the joke many times. Oh, so you got a Desmond then? Oh, blah blah blah. So I had a tutu, and I then discovered that one thousand two hundred people had firsts and two ones. Yeah. And there are 750 places. All right. So that was a very exciting summer for me in 1992, because I then wrote letters. It sounds completely and utterly crazy now. I wrote to the Queen. I wrote to the Prime Minister of the day, wrote to every single important person that I can remember that I could find their address that this is outrageous. I must get into bar school this summer. I'm, I am starting in September or October, it was. I didn't get a response from Her Majesty. That's fine. Oh. Um, well, you know, I'm still upset she's about busy. it. I'm sure she's Yeah, busy. she's too busy. Yeah. And I'm sure she, later on in practice, I then realized that Her Majesty had a special department where a lot of crackpots write to the Queen. And I had a client once who wrote to the Queen repeatedly, and he did actually get a response from one of Her, the, Her Majesty's private secretaries who's de designated to respond to, to nutters, basically. But <laughs> I didn't get a response. Um, and then I joined this campaign about the Black students failing at the bar school, and I added another campaign, which is to increase the spaces at the bar school and I would ring up the Council of Legal Education almost religiously every evening before closing time to ask them if my name is on the list of those starting in October. So I did that, we went around everywhere. Um, the Peter Herbert, if you remember Peter I, of Herbert. Of course, and I would love to interview Peter Herbert if you're watching. <laughs> Yes. Get in touch. Yes, Peter Herbert would be a very interesting uh, interview for you. But anyway, I met Peter a few years before, but that summer was very, very hot. We went everywhere, and Peter was very, very courageous. He spoke out everywhere. And eventually, they increased the spaces at Bar School from 750 to 1,200. And that was achieved with between the summer when you started campaigning, summer 1992, to October, yes. part of the course. In that About time before, frame. Yes, yes, in that time frame. And the credit goes to the Society of Black Lawyers, which was very ably and courageously led by Peter Herbert yep. at the time. Yeah. I was one of his disciples. I ran around with him. It wasn't all rosy. We had differences, but it was a very, very tough campaign. Yeah. We were we were we will be invited to cocktails. Um, the Lord Chancellor is there. This person is there, and you know, in those kind of environments, people are behaving themselves. They're talking, to, and everybody's being prim and proper, and. At a, at a point, and I always knew the queue, um, Peter would, you know, clink the glasses and, and stand up on a, he will find something to stand up on and address the audience that the reason why, why we're here, there's a campaign going on about the failure rates of black students at the bar school. And we're also having further difficulties of them even getting into bar school. So the two campaigns were twins together. They're related anyway. And eventually the spaces were increased. Even then, I didn't expect to have a, 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 a place because they increased it to 1,200. But there were 1,200 people who had first and two ones. But cut the long story short, I was speaking to Jocelyn Gibbs, who's another very senior barrister around at the moment. And she was also part of that campaign. And um, she, one evening, I can't remember what event we were at. 
And uh, she turned to me and said, well, it sounds like you may have some good news, but I'm not saying more than that. So um, lo and behold, um, during that, the following week, I got the letter saying, you've got a, a place. Now, having got the place, they probably thought that's the end of that campaign, but it wasn't. 